did really well yesterday. It made such good points and points and kind of bulldozed the other crew. Oh, well, uh, I think Doe did very well yesterday as well. I wasn't actually able to catch the whole debate, which kind of sucks, but I'm going to be reviewing it with Doe in the near future. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Doe did a debate yesterday. Um, Doe has not done any sort of online content to that degree for a long time, but Doe really wanted to have a conversation with, uh, uh, well, Doe was pitched a conversation, uh, which ended up being a 3v3 debate, which ended up being, it didn't, was it, was it 3v3? Yeah, it was, still ended up being 3v3, although there were some people who swapped out. Um, in fact, I can actually show you Doe's opening statement. Why don't we just listen in on Doe's opening statement? Because I think Doe's opening statement was really, really, really good. Um, and lots of, uh, in, in fact, Doe has been receiving a, a ton of very, very kind words about its opening statement. So I'm just going to play that for you real quick. Hold on. Let's listen to Doe's opening statement from the debate yesterday. The topic was nonviolence versus violence, which is kind of an interesting topic. But let's listen to Doe's statement real quick, shall we? Doe's opening statement for this debate. Proponents of nonviolence are almost universally not proponents of nonviolence. They are instead majority minded people who see democracy itself as a greater goal than the plight of any oppressed minority peoples. Martyrdom is the nonviolence dogmatist's path towards justice, especially martyrdom of others. Oppressed peoples are made to play the role of martyr, submit to oppression publicly until the majority's mind is changed. Justice is made when the majority changes its legal structures. Liberal theorists on civil disobedience tell us how much more important it is that the authority structures of the majority are not threatened uh, than the suffering of oppressed peoples defending themselves. Oppressed peoples should be more thoughtful about the sensibilities of the majority, they say, or else is implied. This is not a politics of nonviolence. This is the politics of our violence. The most obvious place to see this at play is in the research done into nonviolent resistance. Despite whatever other problems that arise in trying to delineate violence from nonviolence, damage to property is treated as violence consistently throughout these studies, leaving the construction of property completely out of the frame. The construction of a world by those in seats of power, like strapping murderous highways across every nation, forcing the majority of people to become reliant on cars, machines which poison the air, and slaughter 3,700 people and over 1 million vertebrate animals a day, are treated as nonviolent, completely neutral acts. This is the false thesis. We do not see the sensibilities of the majority as a worthy metric for justice, and as such, our allegiance cannot be to nonviolence, legalist structures, or any other political technology deployed to privilege some over others. Our allegiance remains to justice, and it is not just to dogmatically let the innocent get abused. So as you can see, it did a really good job on that panel. I hope, well, I hope you appreciate its opening statement. Um, I don't know. Do we have its closing statement? Does anybody have a direct link to Doe's closing statement? I wonder if I can... Oh, here's the VOD. Maybe I can grab the timestamp of the closing statement because that would be super interesting. Let me see if I can get the timestamp. Here we go. Here we go. Here's 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 Doe's closing statement on Vosh's stream. I'm going to get rid of the overlay again one more time just so we can actually see Doe up there. Yourself. Yeah, you want to integrate yourself, and nonviolence is the answer, actually. Uh, Doe, go right ahead. Sure. Uh, I think to exist as a living thing is to be a force in the world, and to be around other living things means never discounting the possibility that confrontations will intensify. I... Uh, uh, as you can see, our opponents have not shied away at all from their martyrdom beliefs. They do believe that oppressed peoples should uh, wait, get beaten, uh, get abused, uh, get killed, get arrested, uh, as long as it's good for democracy. Um, they Efficiency is the name of their game. Um, they don't care about what is right or just. They have almost not at all tried to actually tackle the just question in this debate. They routinely have only talked about, uh, you know, uh, effectiveness at achieving their goals, which to them is some policy change. Um, there are far more goals. Direct action is, of course, uh, uh, the tactic by which you immediately get what you need by uh, Thank you, Evan uh, well directly. 
Uh, there is no mediation on the scale of the state or anything like that. If you don't want an oil pipeline there, you get rid of it. Uh, if you don't want someone to be arrested, you de-arrest them or whatever. This, of course, is not a a a blanket strategy for every context and every situation. This is just, uh, I just believe that uh, we have to remain uh, uh, allegiant to justice. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh so yeah, now you've gotten to hear Doe's opening and closing statements. The the conversation uh, around uh, violence and nonviolence is always a uh, interesting one um, because uh, one of the things. Um, Vosh Mod's closing statement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember this one too. There is no. Oh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. There's the timestamp. Thank you so much for that timestamp, by the way. That's really, really helpful. That, now let's listen to what Vosh had to say here. And for my part, my opinion is that uh, all violence is bad all the time. I'm not a threat to the United <laughs> States or her interests. So my only moral position at all is that crimes are wrong. Um, yeah. thank Before you. you go, my ch my chat is dying to know how's the cat. He's doing wonderfully, perfect. Incredible, incredible, incredible statement. Even after the call, keep going. Oh, okay. So oh, he continues after the call. Okay, all right. Yeah. Let's hear what he has Hell to say yeah. after the call. Hey, thank right. you for the mostly Whoops. mostly peaceful debate. I thank, thank you all very people. much for uh, my people are moving into position as we speak for coming yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you all have a wonderful day. Okay, yeah, you thanks, too. Gosh. Thanks, Thanks. Bye. You too. thanks Everyone, guys. have a good one. Take care. All right. Sure, yeah. Bye. Oh, now that there. Well, that was about as productive as I expected it to be. That was one of the harder ones to remain neutral on. Uh, obviously, I'm far more sympathetic to Serious Sundays and Doe's perspective on this. So, a a a recap from my perspective, really quick. Um, <clears throat> as discussed briefly in the debate there. Um, violence is essentially inevitable in any protest movement large enough. Seriously, if you have millions of people who are discontented yep. about something, the likelihood of somebody resisting arrest or uh, 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 doing an arson or breaking a window are essentially 100%. So Not just that also, but as we saw, the police doing violence on peaceful protest is an incredibly common outcome. So that's the other side that people often don't like to talk about when they talk about these sorts of violences. Um, that y often the initiator of violence in these protests is the state. And that puts you in a position of either having to endure unjust violence, completely unjustified violence, or to resist it. Anyway, let's continue. There will always be violence in a large enough movement. Um, and and uh, of course, nonviolent elements exist to even violent movements. I mean, not every person in ISIS is out there doing combat shit, right? A lot of them do recruitment shit, uh, which is literally an optics game, hearts and minds, so on and so forth. So the real question is, you know, like, how do you respond to this? Uh, what's effective? What isn't? What's moral? What's not? Um, something has to be both effective and moral for it to be justifiable, of course. I mean, you wouldn't want to do something ineffective just because it's right, because then the outcome of what you're doing doesn't get you what you want so it, it like so you're not getting a good outcome in which case it's not moral really um so um you know in with with that in mind there are a lot of complexities here right obviously uh, most of the time when you have any kind of protest going on you want to appeal to the interests of the majority of the population or at least enough people to affect some change the problem is of course we don't actually know what will or won't be popular in the future and it's not True. always a good metric for determining what will or won't actually get done Again, Martin Luther King Jr. died an unpopular man. And back when he was doing his, say, March in Washington or the, you know, the, the protests and the, the, the speeches and the bus boycotts and so on, overwhelmingly, in poll after poll after poll, the majority of people thought that this was um, uh, bad. They thought it was harmful to the cause of the black man. They thought yep, that they it did. was self-destructive. Because, of course, the polling that was done to ask white people for their opinions on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was done so in this, like, paternalistic, looking down on you, white liberal attitude, right? They weren't asked, do you think the black man deserves more rights? They were asked, do you think Martin Luther King Jr.'s protests assist the black man in their cause or only harm it further? Um, because then it's not a matter of the white person's opinion on black liberation. It's a matter of whether or not they think MLK is doing a good job. 
and something yeah. like 80 yep, percent yep, of yep. them didn't and yet the civil rights movement got passed and racism is over as we all know that solved everything um Malcolm X definitely was not as principled or as effective of a protester as MLK, not even remotely close. However, it is worth pointing out that the FBI allowed MLK to exist. The FBI killed Fred Hampton and destroyed the Black Panther Party. Something was up there, right? Like, there's a reason why the state, and again, keep in mind, it's not like the state liked MLK, right? But there's you know, the, the, the Hoover told him to kill himself, right? But there's a reason why MLK was allowed to do what he did, and the Black Panther Party wasn't. And there was an immediate collaboration on a city, state, and federal level to destroy the Black Panther Party. And that's because black militancy, like real militancy, was very threatening to white hegemony, even though it wasn't popular with white people. Now, keep in mind, the Black Panther Party wasn't violent in the way that you might think they were, right? They... As we all learned in a recent conversation on this stream, uh, the Black Panther Party sometimes did do uh, very aggressive actions like barricading teachers, uh, racist teachers, into, uh, into a building for two days, uh, which uh, famous actor Samuel L. Jackson was a part of. Um, and many people would call that, even to this day, violent, even though technically no one was hurt, they were terribly inconvenienced. No one was technically hurt. Had guns and they showed up outside courthouses, but it's not like they were doing mass shootings or whatever, you know, like their guns were a statement piece. It was a part of their outfit. It was a way of demonstrating power. But for the most part, the actual tactics they employed were community organizing and showing up at places looking scary. But that was enough to get a lot of their leaders killed or FBI'd in some fashion or another. So why? What about black militancy scared the establishment so much, even though MLK was way more effective on a national scale? Well, this is where I'd say there's more to a protest than optics. Yep. There's more to a protest than just the raw percentage value of the population that you can convince. There's way more to it. And Martin, uh, or sorry, Malcolm X understood that. And he acted as a kind of well, dark parallel to the, you know, relatively, uh, at least in the minds of people broadly, you know, like upstanding and well-to-do and respectable and blah, blah, thing that MLK was going for. And I think that juxtaposition is worthwhile, you know, um, maybe good peaceful protests need a less at least less perceptively peaceful because again the black panther party wasn't like running around shooting people but they were perceived as less peaceful um maybe they need that threatening element another good example is in india right gandhi was a peaceful guy and gandhi led peaceful movements but do you think there wasn't fighting between oh was there a lot of fighting oh was there a lot of fighting garage and like indian Sorry, not the Raj, the, the British occupiers and like Indian protesters. No, of course, of course there was fighting. India is a huge country. Of course they were fighting. Gandhi was a central figure, of course, but there was an underlying context of violence. And that was real violence, not like the Black Panther Party who looked scary. In India, they were machine gunning the other people to death. It was, uh, it was, it was significant. You see this parallel all over the place too, right? Like um, <clears throat> Nelson Mandela. Uh, was a uh, peaceful... Well, Nelson Mandela is really complicated. He did so much stuff, it's difficult to fully characterize him and what he's done and what he said. Uh, for the most part, a peaceful and institutionalist individual, somebody who works through procedure, who was willing to be arrested. God, how many times he got arrested so many times. But there's always an underlying context of... Oh. Hi, Lona Bucks. Yeah, of course. I had a, a, a delightful time. Thank you very much. Um... There was always a context of violence in, the, in terms of uh, the removal of South African apartheid. Obviously, that's not a, a peaceful environment and still isn't to this day. There's a lot of uh, resentment lingering in South Africa. Uh, that's going to be a problem for a while. The, the point that I'm getting at here, I, I want to be clear. Overwhelmingly, I think that the, um, the, the effectiveness of non-peaceful protesting, of like deliberately violent protesting, is determined by two things. One, how peaceful is the country already? Are people used to peace? Are people familiar with peace? Have they come to expect peace? And second, how big of an issue are we talking here, right? 
This is why, you know, again, like a peaceful movement in Syria. No, you take up a gun because in Syria, people don't expect peace. There's not really much of a civil society to like work around and through. If you want to do something, you pick up a gun, I, I assume. Syria, not a nice place, but America is a nice place, at least compared to Syria. So over here, people are used to peace. They're, wait, seriously, you're serious? That's the same, oh, okay. Yeah, I know you, you've been in chat for a long time. Nice to hear your voice. I didn't know you were. For the record, I also really, I really like Sirius. Uh, you guys might remember Sirius came on uh, this show to argue with me about AI once. We've had actually a couple of conversations with Sirius. I really like Sirius. Sirius is, is great. Let's continue same person um syria used to be nice okay well you know times change because of us western imperial well it's it's, it's a lot of stuff with syria okay listen um <clears throat> but we're used to peace here in america um so violence doesn't fly i don't some people in america are used to peace i don't 100 percent agree with vosh on this point but that's fine i i agree overall with what he's been saying I don't 100% agree with this part, but that's fine. Not not the way it does in, in other places. Unless it's for a cause serious enough. For example, you know, right now, and I would never advocate for this, but right now some people, certainly not me, have pointed out that it would be possible with a comparatively small amount of violence to disrupt institutions that will kill in the long run hundreds of millions due to climate change. Now, I would never make this argument myself, but some people have. Um, now, right now, as I understand it, based on these stop oil protests in England, people are so antagonistic towards climate protesters that if you even slightly disrupt that, if you're, if you're a climate protester and you hold up a lane of traffic for one minute, people will come out and beat you to death and everyone will cheer. They just don't care. And this is because Hello, Cherry. Good are... to see you. Great to see you, Cherry. Hope you're doing wonderfully. Retarded. That's right. Humans are hey, very Panda. bad at understanding big problems that exist outside the scope of their immediate perception. That's the main, it's just an IQ problem, folks, and it affects everyone. Now, over here in the West, we've been um, mostly lucky enough to exist in institutions and structures that will protect us from the worst and immediate effects of climate change, but not for long. And not even now. As storms grow worse and the tides rise and everything gets worse and food chain gets disrupted and grows more expensive and climate refugees, people's perception of what is and is not an acceptable threshold for violence will shift and so too will their familiarity with violence as the world grows darker. Anyway, I think Vosh is mostly on the money here. There's a bunch of things that are very weird about the violence versus non-violence conversation. For example, um, one of the things that uh, Doe talks about in the debate, and I highly recommend you guys go check out this debate. You can either watch it over on Vosh's channel, or you can watch President Sunday's end, um, or Sirius's end. I'm pretty sure all of the people involved have uploaded their version of it, but you can find it uh, anywhere. One of the things that Doe brings up is the fact that um, what uh, in a lot of conversations, in a lot of arguments that are brought forward by so-called proponents of nonviolence, um, what they consider violence um, is incredibly uh, aggressively defined. Um, violence is uh, anything from uh, actual physical harm to an individual all the way to things like property damage, all the way to things like collateral. So like um, there are studies that have been done on, on movements that will consider violent action um, will we'll consider uh, uh, violent action to be if you block a road um, and that means that the road is blocked and, and somebody loses money as a result of that or potentially somebody might not be able to get to the doctor at a fast enough speed that these sorts of collateral uh, are, are, in, are, are sort of I included in an encroaching definition of violence. And I think that that's very interesting it's interesting the way that violence is played with and yet often um while we can acknowledge that that could be considered a form of violence um uh on one side uh other types of violence are are not considered like for example like what doe brought up the fact that um uh that that people don't consider it violent uh the fact that your house at any moment if it was convenient to the state 
could be a uh, 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 eminent domain. You could have the state come in and say, we are building a highway where your house will be. And in fact, that has happened to thousands upon thousands of Americans in the history of the United States. That one day, someone came to your house, knock, 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 and said, here's a paper that says, we're giving you X amount of money for your house. You need to move out by this date because we are going to plow over your house. Um, uh, we're going to plow over your house to build a highway, a highway which kills lots of people, kills an, un an unbelievable amount of animals, may destroy the environment in the area around it, and actually removes the place that you live. And that is often considered not violent. It's considered simple procedure of a growing state. So it, there's, a, there's a very weird way that violence and nonviolence are talked about. And um, I think that the approach that Doe takes, which is basically the idea that um, violence is a part of the current political paradigm um, and only mental gymnastics would define violence, would be like only extreme mental gymnastics allows you to define violence out of the commit of, of the current political paradigm. Um, that, that once you acknowledge that fact that the current political paradigm, the current economic paradigm is built intrinsically to a deep level on violence. The idea, um, of committing yourself to some sort of nonviolent political movement becomes completely absurd. Even liberals in Texas agree with Doe's side. Oh, this is the, oh, thank you, by the way. Thank you very much for the donation. I deeply appreciate that. Oh yeah, here we go. This is a, this is kind of a perfect example. Neo-Nazis and leftist gun groups face off during a protest at Grand Prairie drag show. Um, Grand Prairie, a protest at an all-ages drag show devolved into a face-off between neo-Nazis and leftist gun, gun groups on Saturday. The latest and most in, intense confrontation over the performances, which have become a flashpoint in the culture war on LGBTQ rights. Here's some photos. You've got uh, uh, suited-up neo-Nazis with a totenkopf, which is a, a, a very, very... That is the symbol of the SS. And then we have, here we have protesters with two armed uh, uh, pro-LGBT protesters. Or as we like to call them here, battle queers. Incredible. Incredible. We've already talked about this extensively on this show, how um, being, able, being prepared and acknowledging the default state of violence allows you to engage in these things in safer and more effective ways. Um, people may argue, oh, it's bad optics to see queer people who are armed. Um, that's true, but optics doesn't have the value of, of saving lives. We know how many incidents with these neo-Nazis have turned into out and out um, bloodbaths. We've seen for years over the last five, six years of politics, especially we've seen the proud boys go to events, start fights, hurt people and get away with it. Those people's lives are damaged by violence. And of course, that's not even to get into discussions of the police. When Dallas agrees with leftists, it's good optics. Yeah. I, 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 I have always been of the opinion that um, the optics argument isn't actually borne out as well as people like to think that it is. The idea um, that like the best optics is laying on the ground and getting beaten when it is simply true that people take strength from seeing others take strength. Um, solidarity can be built by seeing people that you know have your back taking a stand. Um, but it's not just about, um, this conversation isn't just about uh, uh, being prepared for the possibility of violence. This is a conversation about the types of tactics, um, that, that people should be willing to talk about. For example, um, the, the, the type of, uh, the type of behavior or the type of resistance that you see against pipelines, um, which is almost always focused only on property. People 
uh, are not injured by a uh, pipeline by by people who are the la like land defenders and water defenders who are fighting aggressively against the expansion of pipelines um and yet it is framed as as an extreme form of violence for people to obstruct the construction or deconstruct the pipeline. So, for example, if a pipeline is being constructed, people protest, prevent it to be from pre prevent vehicles from getting out there to build it and take apart what's already there. That is per that is uh, sold to the public at large as an extreme violent act. And yet, the flip side, which is that a pipeline that is uh, uh, approved at some federal level, far, far away, that will literally dump poison into your water supply, that will displace you and potentially ruin your entire life, poison your children, kill the environment, is not considered an act of violence. It's a, uh, it's a, it, it's an interesting form of brainwashing that, uh, that that modern uh, capital society has been able to force on people by basically abstracting everything away as economic growth and never actually looking at the harm that's done from it. And a double standard, of course, that's held against protesters, where protesters uh, are expected to only do so uh, in the most subservient way imaginable. You can hold a sign, you can be loud between these hours of the day, and the moment that you go outside of that, the police will declare it an illegal riot, and then they will crack your skull in because you were in violation of the law. Do you guys remember? Uh, some of you old school Demon Mama fans will remember my, my coverage of the Seattle riots, uh, uh, way back, uh, during, uh, during uh, BL during the the George Floyd stuff, and uh, some of you will recall us watching the footage and seeing the moment that a crowd of people protesting peacefully protesting uh, was declared an illegal riot because the police was were able to petition a judge to declare a curfew five minutes in the future when there's a crowd of people packed shoulder to shoulder that could not even possibly be aware. And the police just go, curfew begins in five minutes. Nobody can leave in five minutes. Nobody's going to leave in five minutes. And then immediately, this has been declared an illegal riot. And you see the lines break open. The flashbangs go out. The tear gas goes out. The sticks start bashing people's head in. We saw that footage of the cops smashing a guy's head with his bike. And that is a... Uh, violent protest the protesters got violent because they violated curfew so it's a it's a interesting conversation that i think needs to be had and of course many people are afraid to even discuss the topic they're afraid to ever even acknowledge the latent violence that permeates our system anyway all of this is just commentary to encourage you to go check out the conversation as you can see it was on Vosh's channel. You can go to his uh, his live stream playlist and watch the 3v3 debate. You can go to President Sunday's channel, where I believe President Sunday has it up as both a video and a live stream. So, yeah. Um, I, I highly recommend go checking out, going and checking out the full conversation because uh, uh, all of these people involved, including my lovely Doe, who, who I adore, um, uh, were, had a lot to say about it and they all did a lot of work for the conversation. So, yeah. Um, there is, in the, in, <laughs> if you ask the state everything that you do that is in resistance to them in any form is a form of violence. Um, they will define violence in the broadest terms imaginable when it's for you, and they will not define violence at all when it is directed back at, when it is directed at you. It was funny too at the end of the conversation. Um, at the end of the conversation, um, one of the one of the people on the the anti violence side um was like or on the yeah on the non-violent side was like uh by the way a de-arrest will get you uh 40 years in federal prison which i don't even think that's accurate i don't think that's true um we tried to find where that citation came from a 40-year charge for a de-arrest um and i found that very odd um just so you guys know a de-arrest is basically when 
uh, when you're at a protest, if a cop tries to take down a, a protester and arrest them, um, people basically uh, rush in and circle the cop and pull them apart so that the person can't be arrested. Um, and this is most common. Um, interestingly, you'll notice, not a violent tactic. A tactic that literally just involves separating someone from being arrested while at a protest. And um, most of the time, uh, when it's a de-arrest situation, it's because specifically someone is a peaceful protester and the cops are cracking down for a violation of curfew or you're at an illegal riot or your sign was too mean or you gave me a funny look. And so what will happen is if somebody's like this, people will basically rush in and separate them so the person can run away and the other people can then book it as well. And that's called a de-arrest. It is a specifically non-violent tactic that is designed to ensure that someone doesn't get clapped in irons for, for expressing their First Amendment right. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to what the charges might be if you get caught for de-arresting, but isn't it odd that you would have to, that, uh, that that's the situation we have to even discuss in the first place in America, where protests are so commonly cracked down with, in, with unbelievable force by the cops that even nonviolent protesters have had to develop a tactic for not getting uh, put in prison and beaten. That should make you think a little bit about the state of affairs. Psychosocialism says, do you think lefty protesters could benefit from learning non-injurious rest restraint tactics, hard to press ch for charges or sue for damages when no injuries occur? Of course, I think that's a valuable skill. I think any sort of thing like that is an incredibly valuable skill when you are engaging in, a, in as volatile an environment as the United States, um, especially around protests and, uh, and uh, various other uh, means of resistance. Brutus Magnuson with the $5 says, don't forget you can also get arrested by making eye contact for too long for mad dogging. Cops will try to build a crime around you on the spot. Yep, it's ridiculous. It's insane. We know this is unjust and we know that there are tactics to protect people from that. It's funny too because um, like I said, the, the denouncement at the end of the stream against de-arresting is super, super easy to do when you're not someone who will ever show their their face at a protest or who has ever been an, in an at-risk population. Um, when you go to a protest to, pre to, ex to express your First Amendment rights, your right to free speech, when you go there to be able to say, I will not stand for this violence, I will not stand for the murder of innocent people, and you're getting arrested and hit in the head and beaten and shoved around and had a knee put on your neck, um, <laughs> it's real easy uh, when you're not staring down the gun of a justice system that is looking to do anything it can do you guys remember the charges that were brought against uh, against protesters uh, in Atlanta? That they were charging people who were playing music at the uh, at the uh, Cop City protest. They were trying to charge them with terrorism charges. Do you know how insane, insanely punitive the American justice system is at the current moment in time? The amount of trumped up fake charges. Yeah, it sure is easy to be like, oh yeah, um, you guys shouldn't find any way to like resist that shit. Um, you know, when you're just like, when all you do is, is, is just sit in your nice comfy room and talk about things in the abstract sense and, you know, look down your nose at people. Uh, it's certainly very easy to say, yeah, uh, don't do that thing when other people are, are, are sitting there looking at, years in prison for doing nothing wrong, for not hurting anybody, for making their voice heard. And of course, we know that, um, it, do you guys remember when Trump was sending, uh, uh, was sending, what was it? It was, uh, uh, Customs and Border Patrol, C, uh, C, CB, C, Customs and Border, yeah, CBP, uh, when they were sent, when Trump had Customs and Border Patrol people, uh, snagging people off the street, how do you think those people felt? How do you think, what do you think those people were guilty of that justified them being treated like that? 
It's interesting how uh, the state can just kind of come up with any reason to treat you like hell, to di to hurt you, to permanently injure you, to scar you for life, to damage your ability to get work in the future, and yet anybody who dares say that's fucking wrong and we shouldn't allow that to happen, we should find ways to safely prevent that to the best of our ability, are like, oh, you're an extremist. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. It's absurd. Anyway... Uh, that was just my rant, uh, building off of the, uh, uh, conversation about nonviolence versus violence. Uh, the political paradigm, the political status quo is inherently incredibly, incredibly violent. Um, and I have to say, I agree with Doe hundred percent in saying that, uh, to pretend that it isn't and to act as though, uh, 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 violent tactics are always off the table um, is, is, is an absurd, an absurd statement. No one would do this. Uh, here's an example. One more s example to sell you. Do you guys remember? All of us here are super familiar with the, you, with the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Do you remember how that was done? We watched it. Do you, do you guys remember how it started? Ukraine was sitting there. Putin went on television and announced I am, I'm using my powers as, as the, uh, 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 prime minister of Russia to, to sign a special military engagement act that will allow us to move into Ukraine. He literally wrote a law into action that said it is legal for us to attack your country now. So when you're dealing with people who can pull that type of thing, are you really going to say that Ukrainians uh, responding by building Molotov cocktails so they can set Russian tanks on fire, uh, arming themselves up, uh, 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 running, going to their uh, local uh, mil militia and getting armed to the teeth so that they can fight back against people who are actively invading their country. Are you going to tell me that they're the violent ones? Well, you're right. It is violent action, but so was the invasion in the first place. You see what I'm saying here? Uh, when, when violence is the norm, you can never rule out, uh, violence in the name of self-defense. You can never rule out that option. Anyway. Rapti says, uh, Portland got invaded by feds with live ammo caches who were prepared to gun down par protesters in Portland. Yeah, I showed on this stream, um, a clip of a... A, a clearly a live stream we watched this live stream of a pro of a uh of a of a not a protester of a uh a press a member of the press a a uh who was covering the the uprisings in portland who had i'm not even kidding you was they they showed themselves they were marked with press everywhere they were telling every cop i'm with the press they were not engaging in any sort of actions they were very clearly keeping their distance and we watched them we watched a uh, Portland Police Bureau truck drive by and look the look the guy in the face and throw a flashbang out of the door of their open vehicle, hit him directly in the chest, and then his live stream went down. We watched that happen. The behavior uh, on display uh, is not so. It's not all the uh, you know. When you hear these conversations about nonviolence, it's always they, they always like to f put the focus on oh well you got to make sure you're voting and your representatives are trying hard for you. Well, trying hard is great, but when the when the paradigm, when the status quo is that type of behavior, journalists, explicitly marked journalists, medics, people like that getting beaten and and hit with grenades is insane. That's insane. That's off the cuff. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. This has been my little rant about violence and nonviolence and how the conversation is totally fucked. You guys really should go check out the conversation uh, between Doe, Loner Box, President Sunday, Sirius, and Professor Meat and Wick, uh, which Vosh mo mod uh, modded. You can find it on Vosh's channel, President Sunday's channel, Wick's channel. All of them have a copy of this conversation up. Go check it out. And also, if you enjoyed this little conversation, press subscribe and like down below. The likes mean the world to me. Thank you very, very much.